In this episode, we're going to be talking about 20 ways that childhood trauma may show up in your adult life. <clears throat> it doesn't always. What shows up in your life is not always about childhood trauma. But I wanted to offer you these 20 things to think about. Am I doing these things? Did, where did it come from? Why is it important to know? And if I am doing these things, why I may be likely to attract a hijackal, a difficult person, a relentlessly difficult person. And that is important information to have. So stay tuned. Are you in a crazy-making relationship? Feel anxious, angry, and unsafe? Welcome to Save Your Sanity. Insights, skills, strategies, and inspiration for emerging empowered from toxic relationships and breaking the bonds of emotional abuse. Keep listening. We'll figure a few things out. So whether it's trauma, it was neglect, there was no role model, there was a poor role model, we often don't go back and really look in depth at our childhood. Often when people come to work with me, they will say very honestly, they'll say, I had a great childhood. And probably within 15 minutes, things will have arisen that are questionable about how great that childhood was because we move on. You know, as human beings, we're small. We are forward-moving creatures. You know, we're little, we want to explore, we want to stand up, we want to go outside alone, then we want to go to kindergarten, and then we want to go to school, and then we want to go to high school, and then we want to go to college or get a job. We're always moving forward. And <clears throat> when things really go sideways, sometimes that's the only time we look back to see, what happened to me? Where did this stuff come from? Where do I have these ideas about myself? Why do I think of other people in those terms? So I'm not offering you a definitive list tonight. I'm not saying that these are all causes and there's some kind of direct relationship. I'm just offering you some thoughts to say, hmm, could it be possible that some of the things that I do came from something in my childhood that I perceived as traumatic? Or maybe things that I, in my childhood, I couldn't allow myself to think of as traumatic. <clears throat> I had to think of them as normal or okay. And so they bear talking about. We need to have a look at them. And as I said, they may or may not have happened to you. They may or may not be a direct cause. I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying it's good to think about these things. So... If you recognize some of them, some of them are basic. You will recognize them. They're, they're things that you may have thought of already, but some of them are not. So I'm going to start one, with one that's not. And number one is that you don't ask for help. And if you have been in an abusive situation when you were a child or a traumatic because it was abusive, you may not feel safe asking for help. You would rather suffer through it yourself. You would rather do it yourself than ask for help. And that is often something that shows up when people have had situations in their early life in which they couldn't depend on the people they were supposed to be able to depend on. And so as we grow and we develop, we just don't ask for help. And we'll help anybody, anybody at all. The balance gets very off because sometimes we'll help and help and help and help, but we would never ask for help. And if it were offered, we'd say we didn't need it. And if that's the case, that's one, and they're in no particular order, one way that childhood trauma can show up in your adult life. I was working with a client the other day, and as I said, does this sound familiar? that you never ask for help because you'll give help to anybody? And he went, oh, you're absolutely right. How did you know that? Well, I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I know stuff. And if you want to talk to me, you can go to beaclient.com, and we can talk about stuff. So number one, 
you don't ask for help even when you need it and if you do have to ask for help you feel terrible about it number two goes with it you don't want to be a burden on other people you know when we're little we don't have language but we don't have a fully developed brain either but we do have very sharp fully functional nerves and we sort of learn by body language looks on faces tones of voices all of that whether or not we can a ask for help or b if someone is telling us that we should be invisible and therefore we learn to not be a burden on anybody so it goes hand in hand with number one, that <clears throat> no, no, I don't want to, I don't want you to put yourself out for me. No, I don't need looking after. No, I'm fine. And we can even be kind of feisty about it. No, you know, I'm perfectly capable of doing it all myself. And inside you're thinking, oh, you just cut yourself off from everybody again. Or maybe you've been doing it so long that you don't cut yourself off. You just feel that that's the way you do life. Number three is the fear of rejection. So you don't ask for what you need and want because it wasn't forthcoming when you were young. Or if you were like my family, if I asked for something, I would get the, who do you think you are, young lady, kind of a attitude at me. <clears throat> so therefore, I didn't ask because I didn't want that attitude. And I was afraid that my requests would be rejected. And I equated my requests with me. So if my requests were rejected, I would be rejected. I come from a very, very difficult background. And there are so many things that we need to recognize so that we can heal them within ourselves. And that's what I do in the world. That's why I'm here to help you. And as I said, go to beaclient.com. Or if these things are familiar to you and you'd like to be part of my community, my Emerging Empowered community, come on over to joinintoday.com and be part of that. Great things for you there, including three times a month, a group Ask Me Anything call with me. So <clears throat> don't ask for help. Don't want to be a burden. Afraid of rejection. Number four is a fear of attachment, kind of a fear of getting close to people, even though you might really seem like you want to be around them. Internally, there's a fear of if I get attached, they'll leave me. If I get attached, I may go first and they may not like me as much as I like them. If I get attached, they will cut me off. <clears throat> so I'm not going to get attached. I'll hold back. I'll keep myself a little aloof. I won't be fully engaged. I won't be fully vulnerable because that leads to heartache and that I'm not going to go there. So then if you had that in your childhood and then you, you are with the partner and it keeps showing up as your partner saying, I don't really feel that we have a connection. We're not communicating deeply. You can see where that would go directly to the idea of your fear of attachment. If I get attached, I'll get hurt. If I get attached, I'll be made wrong. And so that shows up and it shows up readily. So here we're already at four things that you may not have thought of that may or may not have come from having some trauma in your early life. And it doesn't have to be things that would make the newspaper, you know. Everybody experiences trauma differently. There can be two children in the same family with the same trauma. One will take it in stride. The other will be deeply affected by it. So there's no right or wrong or good or bad. It's just know yourself, you know. Just know what's happened to you and how you internalized it and what that's operating in your current life as an adult. These are important things. So number five is to do with that attachment. It's also to do with the fear of rejection. We can become codependent. We can give up our emotions and be totally dependent and serving the emotions of another person and look to that other person to tell us that we're good enough. 
that we lose the capacity to decide that we are good enough. So we become codependent on somebody else needing us, needing us, and that makes us feel as though we are important. <clears throat> so codependence can show up as a result of being emotionally um, traumatized or abused or treated poorly or whatever word suits you to use that did not provide a healthy environment, a good way for you to grow in healthy ways. So important. You're not making anybody wrong. You know, nobody got up in the morning. Well, there are a few people, I guess. But most people don't get up in the morning and say, how can I make the rest of the world as miserable as possible today? How can I turn my kids in a direction and play with their emotional well-being? Um, <clears throat> it's just who people are. It's just what they've experienced. And just, I mean, it is solidly that. I don't mean it's only that. It's not simply that. It is that, that they, things have happened to people just in the way they happen to you and their response to those things created how they behave in the world. Which is why I say so frequently on Save Your Sanity is our mantra is ABB. Always believe behavior. And that stands to reason when you're looking in the mirror also believe the behavior of the person in the mirror because that behavior is your underlying belief. We'll often say things that are contrary to our behavior, but always believe behavior. So we, we just talking about one of those responses being codependent. If somebody else's emotional life is more important than yours, if you are almost living their life and waiting to be patted on the head for it, and I, you know, I know that sounds patronizing and I don't mean it to, but waiting like, am I good enough? Am I good enough? That is unhealthy. It's out of balance. And you know, my episode I talk about all the time, 115, the three must-haves of a healthy adult relationship. We won't have that if we're codependent. We just can't have that because there is no equality. There's no sense of equality. And equality is number one on those three must-haves. So if we don't feel equal to other humans, if we don't feel as good as we perceive other humans are, then we want to develop that equality. And often that means that you're going to work on yourself. You're going to <clears throat> take stock, look back on your life, walk through it, ask the tough questions, change some things because it's what you choose to do, and then have a happier, healthier life. And that's important. You know, it, there's a reason that this episode is following the one from last week, which was on emotional well-being. Because we are in charge now as adults of our emotional well-being. We may have given away the keys to our emotional well-being to somebody, particularly if we're codependent. But we can get those keys back once we realize we did that. And that's important. And it's the reason I'm giving you this list. Because, as I said earlier, these are not cause and effect things. These are things for you to think of. Did this happen? Is this why I behave in this way? That's all. Nothing hard and fast. So number Six is exactly that. There's inequality. And when there's inequality, people do not respond well. If you're, you have become codependent, you think the other person is more important than you anyway, just by virtue of the fact they're not you. But we want equality. You know, that, you know, I deserve to take up space and draw breath and have my experiences and learn what I learn and change my mind and all the, but a little as 
you find yourself raised by a hijackal or living with a hijackal, it's not okay with them. They're going to use and abuse you. So you need to find that equality within yourself and, and accept yourself as you are and make changes that you might like to change and know that you can. So frequently people say to me, oh, I've been this way for so long. Yes, but if you don't want to be that way anymore, you can change. You can change. Nobody can cause you to change or make you change uh, or have the power to make you change um, once you're an adult. But you may give that power away and give it over to somebody. So watch for signs of inequality. If there was inequality in your life, and I know, you know, adults are big and we were small. I'm not talking about that kind of, of inequality. I mean that, that you just weren't as worthy as the person next to you or you didn't feel that you were as important as a sibling. Those kinds of things are important. And number seven, now this is a curious one. If you have had any emotional neglect or trauma in your early life, you may be an overthinker. Because not thinking everything through right out to its finest details of possible results could mean that you made a mistake. And when you have had that kind of trauma response, making a mistake is not something you want to do. So you can become overthinking to the point of analysis paralysis. You know, you, you overthink it and overthink it and overthink it and and the two week holiday that you were trying to try to plan, you've used it overthinking and it's gone now. <laughs> of course, that's an overstatement, but you know what I mean. Have you ever experienced that sense of, I've just got to get it right. I've just got to get it right. I've got to think of all the parts. I've got to think of all the possible things that could happen and could go wrong. And if I don't do that, I'm letting myself down. And that all comes from fear. And that can certainly be something that was picked up in childhood. And number eight is an obvious one, that if you had that situation, you may feel that your self-esteem is a bit lacking. And the good thing about self-esteem is if we think we don't have the high level of self-esteem that we need or an adequate level, you can work on it. You know, get some help, work on it. If you don't get help, watch podcasts and YouTube videos and, and recognize that you can change a pattern within you. You can. And if poor self-esteem is something that you've come to kind of hide behind in your life, no, come on out and play. Come on out and, and be in the sunshine and allow yourself to be equal. And it might take a bit of a journey, but you're worth it. So let's do that. Number nine is also one you might have thought of, which you may be slipping or lacking in the self-confidence arena, that you don't say what you think, you don't speak up, you don't feel you have the right, you may have a great idea, but it, you don't speak up at the meeting, um, you don't ask for what you need and want because you're a little bit self-conscious or just lacking in the confidence to say, I have the right to ask. You know, the thing about asking for what you need and want is the healthy response is to be able to hear yes or no and take it in stride. And then you will know it's okay to ask because I can accept yes or no and I can take it in stride. So that becomes also another feature. Number 10 is the inability or unwillingness to express your emotions. And that's because perhaps in your early life, it wasn't safe to do so. Maybe nobody was interested. Or if you did say it, you know, someone would say, as they used to say in my childhood, if I want some music from you, I'll push the button. Who cares what you feel? You know, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. And it does matter because you are here. And you deserve to take up space and draw breath and to have your own voice. So if you have an inability or an unwillingness to express your emotions, your feelings, 
ask yourself, was it safe for me to do that when I was younger? Were people interested in it? Or was I dismissed or discounted at a minimum? And if that's the case, say, I don't want that anymore. I want to be heard. I want to speak up. I want to feel confident that I can speak up and that people would be interested in what I have to say. You know, we can get very, very trapped in our fears from our young life, and they may not well not apply to us in our adult life. And that's important to see. You know, I talk so much about life with hijackles, but one of the important pieces that is the starting point for changing everything is changing the way that you see yourself and the way you see life and what you're asking for and what you need and want and your willingness to stand up and say, I need help, I need to be seen, I need to be accepted. And that's very freeing could be really frightening for a bit, but once you get into it, it can be very freeing. And then once you learn that whether you ask for something and you hear yes or no, you survive, then you have a whole other opening for doing things differently. But it could be that you learn some of these things early on and it has shaped your life. It's sent it curving some way or put it down uh, some cul-de-sac somewhere where you can't get out and all you need is a little guide on the side to make that different and as I said if you want my help go to beaclient.com so number uh, 11 one that you probably already know is that if you were devalued or discounted or dismissed in your younger life you may feel that you have to turn yourself into a pretzel and be a people pleaser. That I'm just going to do whatever you like, whatever you want. And when you tell me I'm wrong, I'm going to believe you. And that's tough stuff because it's not true. It, you know, a good idea is to reflect on it and say, is this true? And when you realize it isn't true, then dismiss it. But it's important if you've become a people pleaser to realize it and say, I can get back in balance. I need as much compassion for others as I need compassion for myself. I need to be balancing my emotional well being. And it's way off balance because I'm really concerned about other people all the time and not about myself. But I may have learned that that's the only way to survive when I was younger. So you can see where that would be super attractive to a hijackal if you came in that packaging with that idea about yourself and they didn't have to groom you to do that. That's why hijackals are attracted to people who have had childhood trauma because you're already groomed to be malleable, to be able to be shaped, and it's not as much work for them, and they're basically emotionally lazy. So that would show up if you already know you're a people pleaser. And I know when people say to me, I'm a people pleaser, I know I am, they don't smile and be proud about it. They feel like, oh, I've given something up. And you have. You've given up a sense of self that is equally as strong as anyone else's. And you deserve to have that intact and to have that functioning for you. So another thing that you may find in your life that goes along with looking at what happened to you when you were young is that you have a difficulty regulating your emotions. You know, you're not a little bit this or that. You're really angry or really feel inferior it's not like well occasionally I get angry occasionally I feel inferior it tends to be really polarized emotions it's all rage or it's all silence and and the regulation isn't there the the just the frequency wave of yeah you're going to go through emotions all the time you're going to feel differently and that's appropriate and that you can express those you have you know stopped expressing them or feel you don't have the right 
And so you, you get that op opportunity to look at, can I self-regulate my emotions? Or have I chosen to be with somebody who I was hoping to co-regulate with? In other words, that we'd be each other's best friend and we'd, we'd go along and, and it would work out beautifully. Or is, am I with somebody or did I have a parent who wanted me to co-regulate to their dysfunction? And they wanted me to turn myself into that pretzel in order to stay out of their way or try to make them happy or keep them pleased or avoid their scorn or their abuse. So we need to look at the way we regulate our emotions and get some help if you find that's difficult. If you find you get stuck in an emotion, you know, another one of the things on the list is that you may find and it's not all that common but it's become more common and you can read about it you could google it you can google cptsd you know we all know post-traumatic stress disorder but cptsd is complex post-traumatic stress disorder and where we we talk about that coming from it's not a major event or two that sticks out in our mind it is like death by ten thousand paper cuts it's like <clears throat> i i feel uncomfortable i feel afraid i feel concerned i you know all of that all of the time and and i'm afraid but i don't think of one thing that happened to me and that can certainly be something that will be your response to, to um, trauma in your earlier life. When I say earlier life, it may be in your childhood, in your teens, in an early relationship, somewhere that made a major impact on you during your development. So here's another. You may have anger issues. And they may be overt so that you get angry too easily and you're you're not happy with that. Or they could be covert. That you're just simmering in resentment all the time. And you don't feel you can do anything about it. You can't speak up. So you push people away with the overt anger because they don't want to touch it with a barge pole because you're too sensitive. And it may be that you take on all of this and you internalize it and you make yourself ill because you're simmering in resentment all the time because that's what good kids do. You just be quiet. You don't express that. I don't want to hear about your feelings. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. You see how that gets compressed into you? And that can hurt you. That can hurt you. Everything needs to be thought of again fresh and new so that you can say i'm going to keep this piece i don't know where i got this piece but now that i've figured it out i don't want it anymore or i'm going to make a modification of it there's part of it that serves me there's part of it that doesn't i'm going to release what serves me and keep the rest another thing that may have shown up in your life is that you you have a feeling of being disconnected that everybody's a bit at a distance in kind of a safe distance you know you can marry somebody and then st still feel like we're not connected we're we're coexisting we may be collaborating and cooperating but when push comes to shove we're just not a unit and i can even say that i can depend on them i can say those things but i don't feel it I just don't feel it and because I have this feeling of it's not safe to fully connect. Again, back to the earlier one, and not safe to fully attach. Not safe, so I'll just keep my distance. I'll do enough, but I'll keep my distance. Now, that one can really bite you, right? Because if you're feeling disconnected and you're longing is to connect that is such a dichotomy that is trying to go in two directions at once so you're longing to connect but you're afraid to connect that's a really good thing to talk to me about <laughs> um so as i said before you can find me at beaclient.com if that one just rang a bell 
it's a big thing. And if you think, oh, I'd rather talk about it in a group, come on over to my Emerging Empowered Community at joinintoday.com. We talk about those things frequently. So understanding that this, this feeling of not being connected, just that little bit of distance, that, little, that can be really hard on your heart and hard on the hearts of people who want to be close to you. And so recognize that one if it's true for you and do something with it and about it. Another one is the fear of attachment and the lack of attachment that I talked about attachment before means it could be that I get anxious around attachment. I, I'm, I'm not sure what people want. I'm not sure if I can get it right. I'm not good at second-guessing them, but I'm sure good at second-guessing myself. So we get anxiety, anxious around people, anxious around relationships, particularly anxious around close relationships. And then because we were pre-groomed by earlier trauma, hijackles say, oh, there's one I don't have to work at very much to agitate. Let me find that one. And then I can get what I want and do what I will. So you can see that, as I said earlier, if you have experienced trauma or loss or emotional upset or neglect or whatever word you want to put on it before, you may be a sitting duck for a hijackal to come along and say, oh, I won't have to work too hard if I choose this one. And that's worth thinking about too, because know that as you come into your own, as you redevelop your sense of self, your confidence grows, your self-esteem grows, you know how to set boundaries and all those things, hijackals find that terribly threatening. And so your relationship will change. All relationships will change if you find that these things can be identified and then healed. So important. So let's finish the list because I just wanted to give you an overview of all of this in this episode. I've talked about some of these things in whole episodes. I did a whole episode on the fear of rejection. So you can look at those things. Go to where you like to get your podcast, put in Shaler, S-H-A-L-E-R, my name, and then then the topic that you'd like to talk, you'd like to uh, consider. And then you will find all the episodes. There are hundreds of them. So there's lots of opportunity for you to find them. And um, so this um, next one is a big topic. You know, you may be suffering from low level depression. You're afraid to get excited about things because they might disappear. You're afraid to believe the good in life because it might be ripped out from under you. And you may have low-level depression. You may have greater than low-level depression. And often going through what happened to you previously can be a help to see that it has changed your expectations of life currently. And so there is this low level response of I'm gonna damp things down, not gonna get excited, not gonna to be too hopeful, not going to anticipate good. And we begin to feel depression. Now there are all kinds of depression for all kinds of reasons. So I'm certainly not covering this adequately. But on the list I want you to think about, if you find yourself with low level depression or find it a lot easier to go to the negative side than the positive, it could be because that's what you've experienced too much in your younger life. And then this. And you may not think of this as an issue that stemmed from that, but it is the issue of perfectionism. If you were raised by difficult people or hijackals or people who 
really didn't want children or didn't have time for them. You may have undertaken the notion that if I could just be perfect, then they'd like me. If I could just do things so well that they had nothing to complain about, maybe they would like me. And maybe you use that word that I would like to remove from the English language, if possible, on yourself. I should be better. I should know better. I should do things differently. No, 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 no. Don't should on yourself, as they say. It, there is, it isn't a should. It's an option. It's a possibility. You could, right? If you could just change the word should to could in all of your sentences, it would open you to possibilities and options and open your mind to, oh, things could be different. So that becomes very important. Um, and the last one that goes with all of those is the fear of trusting. Because you, you need to be able to trust that you're safe. That you're safe emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually, in every possible way. And if you haven't been safe, it's really difficult to anticipate that safety is just around the corner. And that may have resonated with you quite readily because if you're a child who lives in, are they coming home? Aren't they coming home? Is there something to eat? Is there not something to eat? Do they like me? Don't they like me? Am I important? Am I not? I did a whole episode on worthy, wanted, and welcome. You know, is that how you came into the world? or the opposite, or somewhere in between. Because feeling the trusting that you will be safe in a relationship is so important. And to move away from ones in which you don't feel safe. But if you haven't done the work, you will have an underlying feeling that maybe you deserve to not feel safe. And that happens to a lot of people. All of these things can be changed. That's the good news. If anything that I talked about tonight, you went, oh, yeah, that's the way I feel. Or, oh, I do that. Or that's my mindset. Or that's why things are not working. You know, friends don't want to be around people who constantly do things for them but never let them do things in the other direction. They don't. It builds a, an innate sense of inequality. And they don't like it. So I hope this is helpful. That all of these things that I have listed may or may not have meaning to you, may or may not be a response to earlier trauma in your life. But just in case they are, I wanted to give you the list so that you could consider them. If I can be helpful to you, come over to BeAClient.com. You can find all my books and courses all there at EmergingEmpowered.com. My main website, EmergingEmpowered.com, because I want to help you be emerging empowered into who you like who you want to be, who knows you have skills and strategies and equality and reciprocity and mutuality. And you can develop that. I'm here to help you. Lots of people are here to help you. And I hope that you want that for yourself. So I hope this has helped you. And until we meet again, take very good care of yourself because you're precious and you matter. Talk soon. <laughs>